Hey! In today's video I'm going to introduce the notion of a symmetric monoidal infinity category. Symmetric monoidal infinity category or a symmetric monoidal structure in that sense is just a generalization of the notion of an ordinary symmetric monoidal category to the land of infinity categories. And the upshot is that everything basically works the same. So we'll also talk about symmetric monoidal functors and most importantly we're going to state that the infinity categories of spectra and the derived infinity category of a commutative ring have canonical symmetric monoidal structures. This will be used later to define Hochschild homology and topological Hochschild homology and will be very important for the rest of the course. The notion of symmetric monoidal infinity category could in theory be taken as a complete black box without going into the details if you just are willing to believe that there is this notion in infinity categories. So maybe at this point you already have a feeling for the fact that most notions from ordinary category theory carry over to infinity categories and sometimes it's a little bit technical to, to set this up but most of the time everything works as is expected. Hi, I'm Thomas Nikolaus from Mathematics Münster. Let's first uh, try to recall the notion of an ordinary symmetric monoidal category. An ordinary, maybe let me put that in brackets here, symmetric monoidal, monoidal category consists of Well, first we have, of course, an underlying category. I'll denote C here. Then you have a functor tensor from C cross C to C. Then we have a unit, which I denote bold phase 1C. And then you have iso natural isomorphisms. Um, A tensor B tensor C is naturally isomorphic to A tensor B tensor C. So this is, uh, when I say natural, this is natural as functors from C cross C cross C to C, right? A, B, C are objects in C. So that's a sort of associativity isomorphism. And then we have a unitality isomorphism or two actually. 1C is isomorphic to A and of course also 1C tensor A is isomorphic to A. And then we also have the symmetry isomorphism which is an isomorphism A tensor B is isomorphic to B tensor A. Okay. Uh, that's the datum of a symmetric monoidal category and it satisfies a bunch of relations. It satisfies a number of coherence conditions. And I guess there's, there's a whole lot of uh, ways these structures interact. Let me just uh, write down one. And that is maybe uh, the pentagon identity, that is A tensor B tensor C tensor D. So I can form this term here and now what I can do is I can start uh, using the associativity to re-bracket that in a bunch of different ways. And so the first thing I want to do is I want to use associativity for this bracket here. So I get that this is the same as A tensor B tensor C tensor D. And now I can use associativity for I guess this bracket here. Then this is isomorphic. So in other words I get an isomorphism to A tensor um, I guess B tensor C tensor D and let's see where we end up. We could also have first used uh, associativity isomorphism in that bracket then we got something like A tensor 
B tensor C tensor D. And once we've done that, we can use the uh, associativity for, well, let me look it up. I just wrote it down earlier today. I guess we can use it um, to get an isomorphism A, I mean, I guess now we're, we're going to use it for this bracket here, right? So what, what do we get? We get an isomorphism to A tensor a tensor B tensor C tensor D. And finally, we can, I guess, uh, can go here by uh, using the associativity isomorphism in that inner bracket here. And that's a pentagon, and that is required to commute. So that's a pentagon. And then there are similarly, similar uh, conditions which, require, which are required for unitality and for symmetry and for the interaction between the three. And if you haven't seen that, this is maybe a good place to stop the video, look up the official definition or maybe you, you think about what are, I mean, there's this thing in category theory, whenever you write down something like that, basically you say all diagrams which possibly are supposed to commute should commute. So maybe, maybe first sit down and write down the axioms you think should hold and then match this with the official definition. Okay, and in such a case we write, we simply, we abbreviate, abbreviate this as C tensor or maybe just C. So. So we just sort of speak of a symmetric monoidal category C by the usual abuse of notation and just drop all the additional datum. Or maybe sometimes we denote this bifunctor tensor here as well. And what we also will do, we will write a t for, for a sequence of objects A, B, C, well I guess maybe I better number them, A1 tensor a2 tensor A3 until An will just be given by a just bracket in say this order. A2 tensor A3 tensor dot 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 tensor An. Right, so uh, I just define the tensor product of N elements by choosing this bracketing and of course by the Associativity isomorphism, I could have chosen any other bracketing and it would be naturally isomorphic and lead to the same notion in the end. So it doesn't matter. Okay, that's the notion of a symmetric monoidal category. And as usual, as soon as you invent a notion of an object, you'd rather want to immediately also invent the structure preserving morphisms. So a lex symmetric monoidal functor lex symmetric monoidal functor between symmetric monoidal categories C and D is given by the following datum. Well, first of all, we have a functor F from C to D. And secondly, we have natural isomorphisms, uh, sorry, natural morphisms from F of C tensor, and this is the tensor product in D, f of c prime, into f of c tensor, and this is the tensor product in C, c prime, where here c and c prime are objects in C. So a natural morphism in this direction, and secondly, a natural morphism uh, 1 d, the unit in D, to f of the unit in C. And these satisfy compatibility 
conditions with uh, the constraints. So associativity, associativity, uh, the unitality, and the symmetry isomorphisms. Right, for example, I want somehow the symmetry isomorphism here be the same as the uh, f of the symmetry isomorphism here, or at least I shouldn't say the same, but the natural square will commute. So again, uh, it's a good exercise to just sit down and write down all the uh, requirements we really have. And um, such a functor, such a lag symmetric monoidal functor, functor, is called strong symmetric monoidal or maybe just symmetric monoidal if the maps above and 1D into F of 1C are isomorphisms. Right. Okay. And again, of course, I mean, maybe it's already clear to everyone, but you should think of a symmetric monoidal category as a category categorification of commutative monoid. So it's like a commutative monoid, right? You have a category and you have a multiplication and it's associative and commutative and unital. And in that sense, uh, functors, those functors correspond to morphisms of commutative monoids. But the, the point is in, in category theory you can, uh, you can require that to preserve the structure only up to maps or up to isomorphisms. So this lower one is the more important one. So these are the real like structure preserving morphisms of symmetric monoidal categories, but those will also sometimes play a role in our lecture course and in general. That's why I invented them. And we want to invent fun one final notion, namely the notion of a closed symmetric monoidal category. So a symmetric monoidal category, and that's just a property of a symmetric monoidal category. It's called closed if for every object C and C, the functor tensor C, black. So that's a functor from C to C. So you fix one C and then consider it as a functor in the other variable and it makes a right adjoint. Right adjoint. And the right adjoint will then be written as hom and referred to as the inner hom. It makes a right adjoint in particular And this is what we will really need for today. In particular, it preserves co-limits in C. So whenever I have a co-limit in C, then tendering it with a fixed object will again lead to a co-limit in C. And uh, of course, because we are symmetric, can also consider the symmetric functor, which is C tensor blank, but this is naturally isomorphic to this functor. So I guess if you're not, if you're not symmetric, if you would contemplate non-symmetric monoidal categories, then you would uh, also ask the symmetric functor or the other functor to have a right adjoint, but this is automatically here. Okay, and here's a proposition. 
So by the way, bear with me for a bit. We're, we're going to turn to something less uh, well known in a second, namely about the infinity categorical notions. But let me just first prepare the ground by reviewing one categorically what we're going to generalize in a second. And that's the following proposition. So assume that, I guess I haven't given you any example. And here, this example will come as a proposition. Assume that R is a commutative ring. ring, then the category mod R of R modules, the ordinary category of R module admits a essentially unique unique Symmetric monoidal structure. A closed, I should say, structure, which is closed. And with tensor unit unit R. And of course, this will be denoted, the bifunctor will be denoted tensor R. Mod R. And this is, of course, the symmetric monoidal structure we all know and love, namely just the relative tensor product over the commutative base ring R. For example, if R is uh, the integer, then this is just a category of Abelian groups, and it's just a tensor product of Abelian groups. So the key here is. I want to state it a little bit more than it's usually done, namely I'm stating that it's essentially unique. Just by the requirement that it's closed and the tensor unit is R. And let me give a proof sketch. And I guess existence is clear. <laughs> but um, let's start contemplating if we had any symmetric monoidal structure which satisfies the, that it's closed and has tensor unit R, what do we, what do we get for our tensor, our like sort of unknown symmetric monoidal structure with M? So this has to be canonically isomorphic, isomorphic to M, right? Because R is a tensor unit and tensoring with the tensor unit by the unitality constraint has to be isomorphic to M. So tensoring any object with R is, is determined to be M, naturally. What about if we tensor with a direct sum of R's? Tensor M. Well, here actually we know that our structure is closed. So tensoring with M will just preserve co-limits in that variable. So this has to be if it wants to have a chance of being closed, it has to be isomorphic to R tensor M. But because we required R to be the tensor unit, this has to be the direct sum over I M. So we see already tensoring with R and tensoring with free R modules is uniquely determined by this requirement. And now what about tendering with an arbitrary R module N? So if N is an arbitrary R module, then we just find a surjection from a direct sum Rs over I. And then we find a further surjection from a direct sum onto the kernel of that first map. Let's call that map maybe F. I, that's described by a huge matrix. And the point is that IE N is equal to the co-kernel of F. And of course, maybe I should have, this is implicit here, but I could have said this, that zero tensor M is zero. Of course, because zero is the empty co-product, or it's a co-limit, and co-limits have to be preserved. <laughs> 
And so here I'm not, of course, in general, uh, if you want to resolve M, you have to keep going. And I guess in general, you can't, this is not going to be exact, of course, but that doesn't matter. We just want to write N as a co-kernel of F. And in order, to, so what, what do we get? We get that um, N tensor with any M is given by co-kernel F tensor M. And that is then the co-kernel of the map uh, direct sum M over J into direct sum I M. Where this is just the induced map from F, which I will also just induce F. It's just the map which is induced by the matrix. Okay, and here you see this immediately determines what the tensor product has to be. And of course, now it was only sort of writing object up to isomorphism and so on and so forth. But so, of course, at this point, I want to leave it as an exercise. And this is a little bit of a tricky one, if you're careful, to prove my actual claim. Namely, that this uniquely determines a symmetric monoidal structure, and this involves thinking for a second about what I mean by essentially unique. Okay, so that is my, that is my claim here. And in fact, you see, I've actually used some version of Morita theory here, namely that um, mod R is, is generated by R in a, specific, in a certain sense. And I mean, and also the fact that the endomorphisms are R, and this is by the composition, by, by, by some Ekman Hilton argument, the tender product there is already determined by composition in the category. Okay, so that's this claim. And you can extend this even, but now, I mean, of course, I, I don't want to be more mysterious about this tender product than I have to be. It's, it's our good old well known tender product over R. And of course, I also get that the functor. induction from R to S for, should say, for any map R to S of commutative rings, I get the functor induction from mod R to mod S. And this induction functor is symmetric monoidal. And of course, saying is symmetric monoidal is terrible because we just learned that the structure of a symmetric monoidal functor is more than a functor. So I should say naturally, i.e., inherits a refinement, a canonical refinement, refinement to a symmetric monoidal functor. Functor. And where does this come from? This is because if I take two modules and tensor them over R, and then I tensor up to S, that's naturally isomorphic to tendering up to S, and then tendering over S with N tensor R S. Okay, you just use this natural isomorphism and the canonical isomorphism from S to the tensor's up thing from R, and that uh, equips this functor with a symmetric monoidal structure. Again, this is probably most well known to all of you, but if you haven't seen that, you should think that through for a second. And now uh, our goal today is to fully generalize the story to infinity land. So the first thing is we were going to define a symmetric monoidal what a symmetric monoidal infinity category is. Or maybe I should sort of put an unspecified amount. Symmetric monoidal infinity categories such that I mean such that um, NC is an example. The nerve is an example 
for ordinary for an ordinary symmetric minority category. In fact, it will be the case that putting a the structure of a symmetric monoidal infinity category on the nerve of an ordinary category is equivalent to equipping the ordinary category with a symmetric monoidal structure. So in that sense, it generalizes the notion of ordinary symmetric monoidal categories. Then uh, we will also say what lacks strong symmetric monoidal functors. Functors. And so again, this is going to generalize the ordinary notions. And finally, in fact, I, I tried to structure the video today so that at this point, if you're happy believing that there is such a generalization or you know this, the only thing you need to take away from the video today is the following theorem. So you can basically black box everything else, just believing one and two. So the first part of the theorem is that the infinity categories spectra and dr admit essentially unique closed symmetric monoidal structures. And uh, maybe I should have said what closed means. So a symmetric monoidal infinity category is in particular an infinity category and also comes with a functor tensor C cross C to C. Well, the only difference to an ordinary symmetric monoidal category is that this, I mean, we also have associativity isomorphisms, but then there's going to be higher cells and coherences. But in particular, we have such a function that we will also call it closed if tensor blank C to C admits the right adjoint. So closed is exactly the same, and again, it implies that this tensor product with every object preserves colimits. Or said differently, the tensor product preserves colimits in both variables separately. It's kind of bilinear on that colimit, bicontinuous if you want. Essentially unique closed symmetric monoidal structures with units S respectively uh, R. And maybe I should write R bracket zero. So R considered as a chain complex over R concentrated in degree zero. And again, we're going to denote these as tensor S. And that is going to be spectra cross spectra into spectra. And the tensor product here will be denoted tensor R. It goes from dr cross dr into dr. And in fact, this, I mean, being an infinity functor, this is in fact automatically the left derived functor. Of, so sometimes I will write this little a because this functor is exactly the left derived functor of the tensor product, um, the ordinary tensor product of R modules. So we've, we've talked about derived functors, and here, um, in fact, I guess uh, left derived you can make now in both variables at the same time or you can derive in one variable or the other. All of this will result in the same object. But the point being, I don't really have to care. I'm just saying there's a unique one and I'm happy with that. So that's the first part of the theorem. And the second part that we will need heavily is the following. Um, the functors. Chain spectra to dz. I mean, this is the functor that Achim in the spectra video denoted h, but I think we, we decided that h was not an optimal notation for this functor, so let me de de 
noted as chain, so it assigns to a spectrum the, its singular chains, but it's, it's essentially the uniquely determined functor which sends the sphere to the integers and, um, and preserves collimates, I should have said. And which functors do I also have? The functor from spaces into spectra, which is given by taking the suspension spectrum. I mean, you first add a base point and then the suspension spectrum. And I also have the functor tensor R S L, which goes from dr to ds for any map r to s. So the statement is that these inherit, inherit canonical uh, closed uh, strong symmetric monoid structures. I could even make them unique if I, if I wanted to say that correctly, but let me just leave it like this. Okay, so that is the theorem which is most important for today and let me just um, tell you why this is true. Proof sketch and this will of course be very sketchy as I haven't even talked about the notion, but it will be the same proof that I gave you before. Just why is there this tensor product of spectra? And I, I guess by the way I'm, I'm writing this tensor over S because S is a tensor unit and later we'll, we'll generalize this to arbitrary ring spectra, but uh, for the moment this is just notation. And what's the reason it's uniquely determined on the sphere? I mean first of all X is any spectrum. Of course I know how to tensor with S. For any, any given tensor product which is closed and has uh, S as a unit I have to set this to be X. I don't have any choice. And then um, Secondly, if I, how, how do, what's the tensor product with suspension spectrum of any space? Uh, what's a good letter? Y. What is that tensor product? Well, for this I observed that we've seen before that actually in fact suspension spectrum of Y, so is the suspension spectrum of, I mean the space Y can be written as a co-limit over Y of the diagram which is constant the point. Right, we've seen that, that every space is the co-limit of a constant diagram which is indexed over the space itself. And we tensor with x. But now the functor sigma infinity plus being left adjoint preserves co-limits. So this whole thing is the same as the co-limit over y of the suspension spectrum of the point tensor x. And I guess a priori I have to let the co-limit uh, be in this tensor variable here, pull it through sigma infinity plus, but the fact that it's closed I can just pull it out all the way. But what is this? The suspension spectrum of the point is the sphere spectrum. So in other words this is going to be the co-limit over y of x. And so what I've used here is that any suspension spectrum is a co-limit of spheres. And um, of course this formula, if you believe coherence, also shows that the suspension spectrum functor is symmetric monoidal because, well, I mean you also apply it in the other variable and then you see you get co-limit x cross y. So and maybe I should have said where well, this is equipped with a symmetric monoidal structure given by Cartesian product, which I have also not introduced yet. Maybe I should have taken this as part of the theorem that spaces also inherits a unique closed symmetric monoidal structure whose unit is a point. Okay, so that is this and now what about a general spectrum for general, general y? Or maybe, maybe I should first make another step. So what about, what, what is um, the desuspension y? tensor x 
So this is just the inverse of suspension or omega n. And I claim that in general by the fact that it's closed this has to be sigma minus n y tensor x. Why is that? That is because, well, I guess it's true if I erase the minus. And the fact that sigma upper n is an equivalence shows that it's also true for the inverse, which is sigma minus n. So I get this formula and now a general y, a general y spectrum y is equivalent to the colimit of suspension spectra, I guess suspension spectra minus n of y. Of, and then I have the n space. How do, did I write? Did we write that? Y n. And here, actually, I've used the fact that not only, I guess, I, I've used uh, the reduced suspension functor for pointed spaces. So you'd have to repeat this argument for pointed spaces. And then you see that tendering each of those guys tendered with with any x is determined by the upper formula because it's just the minus n suspension of the suspension spectrum of yn and then this uniquely determines how the tensor product looks like. So this determines y tensor x up to isomorphism. So if you believe that there is a closed symmetric monoidal structure with the sphere as a unit, then this has to be the, the spectrum y tensor x up to equivalence, maybe I should say equivalence because we're in an infinity category, has to be uh, obtained by writing y as a co-limit of susp the suspensions of suspension spectra and applying this kind of trick. And of course I could have done the same in x, and there were choices involved somehow in what I did here. I mean, not really, but somehow a priori, you could think there might be choices involved. And of course, there is quite a, quite a bit of work involved in, in making this a rigorous proof, but you can. But besides giving rigorous proofs, I also wanted to tell you that this is the way to think about it. Usually, in fact, the, tensor product of spectra is very often in the literature denoted as smash and called the smash product and that's because if you think of spectra in, in specific point set models then this starts looking like the smash product of pointed spaces. But here we, we do a somewhat model independent approach of, for the tensor product and just say it's uniquely characterized. And the point is that you can just figure out what it is by this trick, right? Write every spectrum as a co-limit of suspension spectrum. Or if you, if you combine the whole trick, then every spectrum is basically a co-limit of shears. That's what I've, I, and these suspensions. That's what I've basically shown here. And then, I mean, from this formula, get what the tensor product has to be. And I guess my implicit claim, which might be subject to being challenged by some of you, I'd, I'd be very interested of, of getting a hard challenge for that. My claim is that with this little formula, you can get everything you ever need to know about the tensor product of spectra. You can just somehow, I mean, knowing that it's a closed symmetric monoidal structure and the sphere is a unit, you can do all the computations and everything you ever need to know about it. And I, in my personal work, have never needed a specific point set model. And I guess, by the way, I should sort of say that this specific, I mean, the, the technical way to, to write down this proof is due to Jacob Lurie. And of course, all of that, all of what I'm doing, what we're doing in this infinity part has been pioneered by Jacob Lurie. I think we tend to forget, forget to give credit to him, but this is just because he's invented all of that. Or at least sort of he's, he's translated it into this infinity language from ideas that were around in stable homotopy theory beforehand. Okay, so this is the, the, part, the spectrum part of the proof and the rest proceeds similar using the description of the derived category that we've talked about before 
as chain complexes of modules and using previous results and so on and so forth. And uh, the fact that it's animated. Okay, so that is an important part of what you need to take away from today's lecture. And now let me get into the brutal technicalities. So let Finstar be the category of finite pointed sets. So every element in Finstar is isomorphic to a set of the form n with 0 through n with 0 as base point. So these are all the typical objects in finite pointed sets. 0 is the base point. And um, so n, nerf fin, n fin is the is nerf i.e. the associated infinity category. And now um, for every, every i in between 1 and n, there's a specific map that I call rho i, which goes from the set n to the set 1. And what does it do? It sends k get mapped to, where it gets mapped to 1 if k is equal to i and gets mapped to 0 else. So it's, it's exactly the map which sends everything to 0 except for a single element and that's i. definition and this is um, the first definition first definition so we will see another definition later today and this goes basically back to Siegel and of course not quite in the language of infinity categories but the idea goes back to Siegel um, this is asymmetric monoidal symmetric monoidal infinity category is a functor n fin star into cut infinity which we maybe denote c lower bar such that such that the induced maps. So for every n I can evaluate c lower bar on n and I can evaluate on 1. And this being a functor for every map from n to 1, for example for every row i, I get an induced map from cn to c1 and I want to group all of those together into a map into the product. So this is a product um, over i, the n-fold product, well, how do you say that, i equals 1 through n, and then I have here the row i's, the induced map from the row i's as the family. So our equivalences. For each, for every every n, 0, 1, and so on. So for n equals 0, this just means this is the empty product, this is a point. So this just means c of 0 is actually equivalent to the point. OK, so that's the definition of a first definition of a symmetric monoidal infinity category. And now uh, I guess my, one might wonder how the hell is this going to implement a symmetric monoidal category. And so the underlying infinity category, which we denote C, is just going to be given by the evaluation at the element 1. 
So remember, this is just a pointed set with two elements, 0 and 1. So that's what we're going to denote C. And what is the tensor product functor? I claim there's also a canonical tensor product functor. And this is C cross C. So what is this? This is, remember, by definition, this is C1 cross C1. But this is actually equivalent to C of 2. Right, why is that? Well, this is this map. This is just a special case of this for n equals 2. So C cross C is equivalent to C2. And now here's a map, which maybe I call m lower star C to 1, where m is a map from 2 to 1 of finite pointed sets, which sends, well, I guess it sends 0 to 0, and it sends 1 to 1, and it sends 2 to 1. So it does not agree with any of the maps rho i in that case. Those maps would exactly send one element to one. Here I'm saying send every non-zero element to one. Okay, and that is the tensor product. And what is the tensor unit? The tensor unit is just the map, uh, I guess one, is just the map from z0, from point, which is equivalent to the well, you add it at zero, and then there is just a map to C evaluated at one, which is just given by the map. Well, I guess there's a unique map from zero to one in fin star, and it's just evaluation at this unique map. And that gives me an element in C, right? It's, it's a functor from the point to C, and that gives me an element in C. Okay, so this encodes a tensor product and so on. And the idea here is, I guess Siegel's idea is that um, all the rest of the structure of this functor, giving a functor from n fin star to cut infinity c on objects that's determined by that up to equivalence, n has to be sent to the n-fold product of the value at 1. So once I have the underlying category fixed, it basically this functor is determined on objects. But then I mean, up to equivalence, of course. And then lifting this to a functor encodes, in particular, this tensor product functor, but it encodes more. And so the claim is that this is a coherent way of encoding all these associativity, symmetry, and unitality constraints. And that is a really nice claim, a really nice model for that. And I guess um, this is not a real exercise, but if you haven't seen that, should think about how why, why this is associative, for example, this tensor product, how this comes out of the combinatorics to get a little bit of a feel for the combinatorics of why this works. And um, but there is a real exercise at this, at this point, namely when when you have an ordinary symmetric monoidal category C, the exercise is to write down a functor from n fin star to cut infinity. In this case, it will in fact land in cut, which sends c to c to the n. So in other words, uh, show that for a symmetric monoidal one category, you canonically get an induced symmetric monoidal infinity category. And that's actually a quite non-trivial exercise because um, I guess, as I said, you, have to, you know what it has to do on objects, and then you have to figure out what it does on morphisms. And as a little hint, um, the category of finite sets, non-pointed, not necessarily pointed finite sets, sits inside of this category by sending a finite set to the finite pointed set where you add join a base point. And then morphisms of finite sets give induced morphisms. So by adding a base point, this sits inside. And maybe you want to first uh, construct a functor out of this category, finite sets to cut infinity, which sends s to c to the s. And then you extend it to finite pointed sets. And what, what you use is that every morphism in finite pointed sets can be uniquely factored into one lying in the image of finite sets and one which is called inert. We will talk about inert morphisms in a second. But this, this helps, helps you in order to, to write down this functor. But again, this is not 
100% canonical, but from, I mean, it's, it's really good in order to see how the combinatorics work out. And this combinatorics will also be somehow the basis for our second definition of a symmetric monolithic category. So it's basically, no matter what, it's, it's a good exercise to understand how these combinatorics work out. Okay. And once you have this notion of symmetric monoidal infinity category in place, you can just define definition a symmetric monoidal functor And of course, again, we are going to commit the same abuse of notation that we will confuse, and I maybe I should have written like underbars here everywhere, sorry for that. Um, I will again, uh, and also here, I apologize, I hope this didn't uh, create too much confusion. Um, Again, we're going to just very often denote, confuse this functor with the underlying category C. That's why, I mean, I already implicitly did that in the definition, unfortunately, which was not intentional, but. Okay, so a symmetric monoidal functor is given by a natural transformation. C bar to D bar. So if if C and D are symmetric monoidal infinity categories, then it's just a natural transformation of the associated functors. Full stop. And so this makes it very easy. So as a, as a category, you could even define the category of symmetric monoidal infinity categories. So on cut infinity, you would just define as a full subcategory as a full subcategory of the category functors from n fin star into cut infinity. All right, just a full subcategory on those functors which satisfy these Siegel conditions. Maybe that those maps are equivalences. Okay, and that's actually a very good definition of symmetric monoidal infinity categories. And basically you could, for everything that follows in this course, you almost can take that as your favorite definition of symmetric monoidal infinity categories. But there are two slight problems with that definition. Or I, I mean, maybe one should not call it problems because they can also be solved, but one, two, two, two little shortcomings. And the first one is, well, I guess now we've defined what a symmetric, strong symmetric monoidal functor is, and maybe I should have so emphasized this here. This is strong. The question is, what is the lag symmetric monoidal transformation? Lag symmetric monoidal functor. And if you think a little bit of, about the combinatorics, a lag symmetric monoidal functor would have to be something like a lag transformation of functors. So you, you don't have a natural transformation of functors, but somehow the, there would be lags in the sense that the squares that show up would only commute up to natural maps and not natural equivalences. So somehow you, you would somehow have to use that cut infinity really is something like an infinity two category and sort of invoke some elements of two category theory. So that will be improved by our second definition in a second. And as another slight problem and maybe this was this exercise. I, I hope some of you managed to solve this exercise and write down the associated functor. But you see, this was not super canonical. You had to make a bunch of choices and, and fiddle, fiddle around and sort of maybe in the end you somehow were convinced that everything works out, but it might be still that, I, I don't know, can't be 100% confident. So it would be nicer if there was a nice way of sort of machinery way of getting from an ordinary symmetric monoidal category to symmetric monoidal infinity category. And those two issues are, are overcome by the following definition. Second, and this is, um, as far as I know, been first given by Jacob Lurie. And again, let me mention that most of what we do follows uh, what Jacob does. And that is a symmetric monoidal monoidal infinity category is a functor. 
is a functor, C tensor. So it's, I mean, I should maybe more precisely say it's a pair consisting of an infinity category, which we denote C upper tensor, and a functor to n, n fin star, satisfying a bunch of conditions, following conditions. So the first condition is that it is a co-Cartesian vibration. And so far we haven't talked about the notion of a co-Cartesian vibration in this course and I will don't really want to talk about the notion of a co-Cartesian vibration in this course. This notion is actually very fundamental for working with infinity categories, but it's a little bit technical at the beginning and you have to, have to set up quite a bit of machinery to, to successfully be able to, to really work with it. And so I want to avoid the notion of a co-Cartesian vibration. Yeah, I'll just give you a little bit of a hint in a second. At the moment, let me just say this is a condition on a functor of infinity categories. And what does this give us? Um, this gives us that um, you can actually look at the fibers. So when we define C tensor upper n, we just want to define this to be the pullback C upper tensor over n fin star. And then actually I have a functor from the point into n fin star given by this element n. This is a pullback. This is a pullback in cut infinity. And it turns out that if you require this to be a co-Cartesian vibration, then this pullback is, is modeled by just taking the actual pullback of simplicial sets. So you can also let this just be the actual fiber over n, the actual like sort of simplicial set. And one of the I, or more or less the most important property of being symmetric monoid, uh, co-Cartesian implies that whenever you have a map f n to m in fin star, you get an induced map f lower shriek from the fiber c tensor over n into c tensor over m. And in fact, so this actually does determine a functor from n fin star into cut infinity, if you, if you do that correctly. But I, that's the reason I don't want to go into that because we can't do that correctly. But I just wanted to invent this notion in order to um, to give you the second condition of what it means to be a symmetric monoidal infinity category. But again, one is just a condition. This, this functor here is uniquely determined by the structure of this category together with the projection down to n fin star. There's no further choices involved. And then there's another condition and the condition is that the induced induced maps. And now again I can play the same game as before. I can write C tensor n. I get an induced map from all the row i lower shrieks to the product of C tensor 1 uh, are equivalences for every n equals 0, 1, 2, and so on. And of course, um, again, I'm going to, again, I'm going to denote notation. I'm going to denote um, C to be C upper tensor 1. And the tensor product functor. C cross C 
which is now again equivalent to C tensor 2. And here I get this induced functor m lower shriek. So C tensor 1, and that is C again. And I will den denote this by the tensor product functor. And you see here everything works the same, and, and the theorem, which is due to Jacob Lurie, and that's a more general theorem really about Cartesian and co Cartesian vibrations, the two definitions. Two definitions agree. That is, is, and so what I mean by agree, that is for every every such symmetric monoidal infinity category, infinity category. C tensor, I mean, and by such I mean according to definition 2, we get an induced, an induced functor get an induced functor n fin star to cut infinity, which sends n to C upper tensor n. And I guess morphisms to the lower shriek things and vice versa. And not only do we get functors both ways, but these are equivalences of the category of symmetric monoidal infinity categories, which here is defined as a subcategory and can also be defined using this notion. So these two, two perspectives are really the same, except uh, for one you have this total space thing. The C tensor is by the way called the category of operators. And the other, I mean this is by the way an infinity, this co cartesian vibration is an infinity categorical incarnation of the notion of a Grotendieck vibration, if you know this from category theory or maybe an op Grotendieck vibration, depending on the conventions. And um, let me finally, I guess this immediately raises the question, how does the inf inverse construction work? How, how if you have a functor from fin star to cut infinity, how do you get a total space C tensor? And um, I, will, I will demonstrate this in the case of an ordinary symmetric monoidal category in order to show you the advantage of this a vibrational approach to symmetric monoidal infinity categories. So let me an ordinary ordinary symmetric monoidal category. We define another ordinary category. The category C upper tensor as follows. So the objects, the objects are given by lists C1 through Cn, objects in C. And um, n is a, I guess n is a, is a number, but maybe I should say n is an object in fin star. So n, n varies. So you, you have lists, arbitrary finite lists of objects. And of course the empty list is also allowed as a list. And morphisms, morphisms from C1 through Cn to d1 through dm are given by pairs by, by first of all a map n to m, we call that f, a map n fin star, 
we have a finite point at sets. And secondly, for each for each um, k in M, I have a, a map f to the minus 1k So f to the minus 1k is a subset, so maybe I should write it differently. So a map from C i, the tensor product over C i, where i ranges through f to the minus 1k C i, I have a map in C from this list into dk. And I guess uh, this doesn't quite make sense if k is zero, so I said, should say this without zero. And here of course um, a map in C. And the way you want to think about that is you want to um, Think about that as if um, everything gets projected to a single object, then this is just a sort of multimorphism. So you want to sort of picture it like this. If you send a bunch of objects to here, and then what, what this looks like, it's basically just grouping together a bunch of these multimorphisms. That's maybe the picture one can have in mind. And there's an obvious, and by the way, uh, a priori, this would involve a bracketing here, but remember, I, for a symmetric monoidal category, I invented the notation that this, I don't have to bracket. So there is an there is a composition uh, defined in the obvious way. making this a category. What do I mean by that? Well, I guess if I stack two maps um, n, m, m, k, then the pre-image of any element of this map will, will decompose in, in terms of the elements in the pre-image here, and then you just tender together the corresponding maps here. Right? If, you just, if you just write down what you have to do here, it's, it's obvious what you have to do, and what the identities are, and so on. And there's a forgetful functor, and a functor, and uh, sorry, from C tensor to fin star. And this functor just forgets all the datum C1 through Cn, just remember Cn. This goes to n, and this map goes to fin star. And of course, the empty list goes to zero, the element zero. Okay, so that's the category of operators. And you see this basically, I mean this involves maybe a little bit of a choice, namely once you bracket this, but it doesn't involve any other choice than that. So this is fairly canonical to write down. And now it turns out that this exactly is a symmetric, I mean if you take the nerve, this is exactly a symmetric monoidal infinity category in the sense of being a co-Cartesian vibration. And that is really, important because this, this gives a canonical way of writing down such a functor from fin star to cut infinity without making any random choices a priori. Okay, and as a last step, I said there were two motivations for defining symmetric monoidal infinity categories in terms of this category of operators. And the second motivation was to be able to define what a what a lag symmetric monoidal functor is. And let me do that. It's definition. And maybe first I should say a morphism. F is called inert if the induced map 
f restricted to f to the minus 1 of m take away 0. So take away the base point. So that's a map from f to the minus 1 m take away 0 into m take away 0 is a bijection. So in other words, the pre-image of every element which is not the base point here is exactly a single. That's when it's called inert and now we can make the following definition. A lax symmetric model functor between symmetric monoidal affinity categories is uh, and now I should maybe say I, I want to think of them in this vibrational point of view fin star and d tensor fin and fin star is a functor over fin star. So I have a functor C tensor into D tensor over nerve for fin star. Maybe F tensor. And when I say this, this could mean two different things. So I, I guess I want to say this commutes. This could mean two different things. This could mean actually in the world of simple Schultz sets, this strictly commutes. In particular, it would involve and induce exact maps on the exact fibers. It could also mean that I fix an additional natural isomorphism witnessing the fact that this commutes. And um, I will just generally mean the second here while, um, while it ends up in this case being equivalent, again by, by some vibrational technology, which I don't want to get into, but I'm going to give you a glimpse anyways, such that such that F tensor sends co-Cartesian lifts, lifts of inert morphisms to co-Cartesian lifts. And this definition I don't want to comment on. So when, when, you, when you understand this co-Cartesian technology, you know what this means. And if not, then not. But uh, instead of giving you details about what this exactly means, I just know two things. First of all, this is just a sort of condition on a functor between the categories of operators. So this is like just talking about ordinary functors and doesn't require some fancy infinity 2 technology. I mean, of course, I mean, admittedly and implicitly does, but not explicitly at least. And secondly, I recommend that you observe that this construction here, which takes an ordinary symmetric monoidal category and produces this category of operators, this is functorial in lax symmetric monoidal functors. That's what I mean here. Like whenever you have a lax symmetric monoidal functor between symmetric monoidal categories, then you just get this induced functor on the categories of operators. And that will give you a feeling for why this is the right notion of lax symmetric monoidal functor. Okay, so that was enough black boxing for today. Let me again say the only things we are really going to need in this course and which you should sort of possibly take as a black box or at least as a takeaway is that there is a working theory of symmetric monoidal infinity categories. There are notions of strong and lax symmetric monoidal functors. And many of the categories we care about like spectra and the derived category of commutative rings inherit canonical and in fact if you say it correctly even unique symmetric monoidal structures. Thank you very much and see you next time.